So about a week ago, I put up a video where I took the A-case patch after I kind of tested out that beads thing uh, and brought it to my basement. We we're clearing out the basement to have it finished. And uh, in that opportunity, I felt, what a perfect little reverb chamber. So I set it up with the travel setup, the uh, pair of Lewitt mics that are um, built into the lid of the case there on the little mic arms and just play a little bit of guitar in the corner. It sounded like this. And I figured it would be worth talking through a little bit of the evolution from the video before that when we were just testing out beads to the patch that was in that video. So this is still the same patch, only difference is instead of the Lewitts, we've got the 4025 still set up in as like a stereo mic into the dual instrument interfaces. And I wanna just talk through a little bit about what's going on in this patch. During this video and right now, even um, I'm recording the patch live on my voice. So if I turn my headphones up, it'll get a little difficult for me to talk as I am hearing the kind of chaos being kind of picked up and transformed. Um, but the essentially the goal of the patch is to take real time incoming audio, pull it into beads, um, automatically on a clock and kind of semi-randomly freeze and unfreeze beads buffer. Meanwhile, sequencing through the current kind of playhead for the grains in its location in that buffer, then the pitch of the grain and the size of the grain using pressure points, taking that entire output signal, bringing it over into the matrix mixer and then spreading it around the case for a whole bunch of uh, different reasons and, and purposes. So a couple of the new things at play here, uh, and it's been a little bit since I have been in front of this, so we're gonna kind of revisit it together. That main signal coming right from the mics here, going into beads, as I just described, coming out of beads and going into this top row of the matrix mixer. I'm gonna turn my headphones up a little bit so I can hear. I'm also gonna bring that pitch back up. Just try to make this a little bit more tolerable for me to listen to as it's processing my own voice right now. Um, <laughs> while explaining what's going on in the patch. So that bead signal, which is kind of like the main voice essentially, is coming into this first row of the matrix mixer. Coming down the first column, I believe it is going to go straight into um, jumble hinge right there. The next column is coming down and that signal is being sent over into panharmonium. Panharmonium is being brought out and going through Optimix and kind of a pseudo stereo setup with the Optimix strike being triggered by some uh, kind of off kilter uh, clock divider signals. If I pull these two knobs down on Optimix we'll end up with a slightly more plucky element there. I also have panharmonium pitched way, way down to give this kind of lower punch to those blocks and those strikes. So maybe if we pull these out there. The output of Optimix is coming actually back up into the matrix mixer right there, which I typically do so that I can then grab that signal. So this is then coming down into jumble hinge, but it's also coming over into this third column, which is going into guillotine. So that's now just the panharmonium. If I turn these all the way down, you're getting that pluck from the low pass gate and optimix, right? 
if I turn up guillotine a bunch more. This, of course, still right now is on a dry Starlab. The entire output of Jumblehenge comes up into Starlab. Probably a good time to talk about the pretty important Starlab modulation that's happening, which is this feedback knob on a super kind of slow, I guess, LFO from Sloth which with the delay tune and echo turned on and that delay tune around noon you get this kind of car plusy effect when feedback feedback gets loud enough right now i got this iphone charger in the way sorry about that let's fix that there we go so as that as that modulation starts to increase and it's automating the feedback knob up you get these big swells that when, if there is anything in the, the mix at that time, turn into these kind of huge waves throughout the piece. And it was that kind of like swelling that when I was experimenting with the guitar in the basement, gave it the characteristic of, you know, if you're totally silent in the same room as the synth, it's not really going to do that. There's not going to be enough signal coming into Star Lab for that car plusy echo to start to take over. But once you start making some noise, and if you're still doing something at the time that that LFO comes around on its cycle, then it's really, really going to get angry and, and wake up at you. So I've got beads coming in. Uh, first channel out to Jumblehenge. Second channel is what goes to Panharmonium. Panharmonium coming back in. Yes, I'm feedbacking Panharmonium. Coming out to Guillotine. Uh, guillotine then I believe goes and sits in these low frequency pair uh, pairings of Jumblehenge. Then the fourth column here, this is for the looper, which I'm not actually even set up with right now. So if I just start a loop, let's bring beats back in. Okay, so let's back down to what it was. Now I basically just created an arbitrarily long loop and immediately started re-recording over it. I've got the looper set up to kind of slowly decay the passes, so as things make it into the looper, they'll stay there as that record head goes past it on subsequent loops for maybe four or five additional passes. So it takes several minutes for once something's in the looper for it to kind of go away and no longer be in the looper anymore. Although we get these weird moments of quiet when the buffer happens to freeze on a sentence that is um, broken. The output of the looper comes back over in these non-tendrils and then rejoins and gets a chance to go through guillotine or feed into panharmonium. That kind of cut something out. Or just go back into Jumblehenge and join that mix there to come up into Star Lab and join the rest of the case. The other mess here that I haven't really talked about yet is my clocking setup. So Oct is setting a clock using repression. Each time it goes past that little equal light, that clock is coming over to my clock divider, which is moving the channel of pressure points across. It's also setting this strike uh, timing, or strike gates, I guess, to the Optimix. And it's also setting another signal up to here to uncertainty, which has a pretty low odds of coming over and a momentary button press trigger on point twos, which will take this high signal almost by default to keep the buffer frozen and every once in a while I'll flip it to low and back to high and that lets me 
control beads in the way I want it to. So the freeze input on beads, in my experience, essentially is frozen if it's high, not frozen if it's low. So it's a little annoying if I just had like straight triggers to like turn on and off the, the freeze. What I need is a gate of a pretty long length. So thankfully Pointus is able to like let me make that long gate built off the same single clock uh, so that I can have beads still kind of transforming and following the live audio without being so directly in sync with the live audio that it's like an effects pedal. mixer makes it crazy fun to feedback patch like I've got you know this channel out is into the looper and then I've got the looper coming back in going back into the looper in addition to being you know put through guillotine worked back into panharmonium which is coming again back up into here and back down into the looper so there are so many different feedback loops happening thanks to the matrix mixer that also are very flexible in that I could change a lot of this patch and still have a whole lot of different like performance lanes. signal out of sloth is controlling density which is this you know how often is the seed the auto seed clock running so that's kind of ramping up and down the strength of the uh, or the frequency of the seeding from beads again on that pretty much usually frozen buffer it's just being refreshed every once in a while turn our clock essentially off here.
that's it. I know I've um, made a lot of videos about the evolution of this case, and then obviously the July stuff was all essentially sampling the B case into this case uh, and performing it in a pretty you know, static patch for almost the entire month. So to be able to get through that, learn a lot about how the instrument I configured, built, whatever, um, works, and then being able to take a lot of that and shift it over to beads, like I mentioned in a couple videos ago, um, while opening up the looper to really stretch and pull things far out, it makes it really exciting for me when I can fulfill the goal I had in my head around an instrument that can grab on to any incoming audio and radically transform it into something else. I think it's it's kind of funny that my favorite synth has kind of no traditional oscillators. Um, but I... I so much of this is so close to being exactly what I want it to be and is so fine fine tuned for me that I, I just couldn't be happier. So that's the patch. If you have any questions, um, drop in the comments and I will see you next time. Peace.